The CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by listeners like you who contribute to our Patreon page. You can learn more at patreon.com slash the CyberWire. The Edgar breach is seen as a blow to confidence in financial systems. Credit bureaus continue to receive heightened scrutiny after the Equifax breach. Finn Fisher campaign suggests ISPs may have been compromised. The back door in SeaCleaner seems to have targeted specific companies. U.S. Forces Korea personnel receive a bogus non-combatant evacuation order. Someone behind Lockie watches a lot of Game of Thrones. And poor Thomas the Tank Engine would never do what some skids show him doing. It's time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Recorded Future. Our fun 2017 is back, and Washington, D.C.'s got it. Join Recorded Future and other leaders in the threat intelligence space this October 4th and 5th. Get industry insight. Hear from top cybersecurity and corporate strategy experts as they share their ideas and experiences. Teresa Shea, now of InQtel, formerly NSA's director of SIGINT, the Grug, expert in most things InfoSec and a connoisseur of intelligence and info operations. Mike Cole, author and cyber threat intelligence analyst with a major metropolitan police department. Priscilla Moriucci, former enduring threat manager for East Asia and Pacific at NSA. And finally, Robert M. Lee, founder and CEO at Drago Security and National Cybersecurity Fellow at the New America Think Tank. And say hello to us. The CyberWire will be there and podcasting from the floor on the 5th. If you're a threat intelligence enthusiast, register now at recordedfuture.com slash rfun. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Friday, September 22nd, 2017. The breach of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission Edgar system has spooked investors and legislators alike. It's being called a blow to confidence in the U.S. financial system. How serious a blow remains to be seen. The financial sector has long been a leader in adopting such security measures as threat information sharing, encryption, and fraud detection. And the SEC, as one of that sector's principal regulatory bodies, has pushed for more attention to cybersecurity and risk management in the entities it oversees. It is the SEC, for example, that has moved publicly traded companies to explicitly address cyber risk in their regular 10K filings. As is so often the case when a high-profile breach is disclosed, closer scrutiny reveals that the Department of Homeland Security had warned the SEC of unaddressed vulnerabilities back in January, and a congressional study released this July in which the Government Accountability Office found the SEC had failed to fully implement 11 security recommendations made two years ago. These are embarrassing, but not directly related to the breach, which seems to have taken place and been detected last year. It was only last month, however, August 2017, when the SEC realized that whoever hacked Edgar probably was able to execute illicit insider trades based on early knowledge of the still non-public material information they found there. The hackers did obtain data that would have given them an illegal advantage in trading stocks. How much they may have made on such speculation remains unknown, as does the identity of the threat actor that found its way into Edgar. Nation-states, terrorists, and ordinary criminals are all possibilities, and little that's been made public would incline one to choose one category over another. The SEC breach announcement feels like the second haymaker in a one-two punch whose first blow came two weeks ago when the credit bureau Equifax got around to disclosing that its own systems had been penetrated. But the risks the two cases involve are quite distinct. The SEC says that no personally identifying information was compromised, but with Equifax, personal data was stolen with a vengeance. Here, too, there's no clear indication of who might have been responsible. It now seems that whoever hit Equifax spent several months carefully establishing their presence in its systems. They started working their way into its networks at least as early as March 10th of this year, According to Ars Technica, Mandiant, the FireEye unit Equifax has brought in to clean up, says it's detected roughly 35 IP addresses the attackers used to access the company's network. The attacker's identity is still unknown, and Mandiant has so far not found any signs that point to known threat actors. 
Ben Fisher spyware, the controversial lawful intercept product, has been romping lately in the wild. Security firm ESET warns that ongoing campaigns distributing the FinSpy surveillance tool have features that suggest some Internet service providers may have been compromised to distribute the lawful Internet product to its targets by man-in-the-middle attacks. In the past, Finn Fisher spyware has typically been spread by spear phishing, watering hole attacks, physical access, or zero days, so compromised ISPs represent a departure. Investigation into the supply chain's insinuation of a back door into a vast sea cleaner security product moves toward the conclusion that the effort was more closely targeted than initially believed. Cisco thinks the hackers were after a relatively small number of large companies. Intel, Microsoft, Linksys, D-Link, Google, Samsung, Cisco, O2, Vodafone, and Gosselman. Things are tense in the Korean Peninsula, but not yet so tense that U.S. civilians are being evacuated. U.S. Forces Korea says the text and social media messages that yesterday appeared to be a non-combatant evacuation order telling U.S. civilians to leave South Korea at once was a hoax. Responsibility has not been determined. It could be a state actor, with Pyongyang the obvious suspect, but a freelancing skid doing it for the sick lulls is just as likely. Maybe even more likely. In any case, U.S. forces Korea was quick to squash the rumor. Finally, we all know that ransomware is a problem. We heard late this morning from FishMe, the security company who's been tracking the latest round of locky phishing infestations, FishMe's noticing that those responsible for the ransomware attacks seem to watch an awful lot of Game of Thrones. Any suggestion, however, that the extortionists are white walkers is probably unfounded. Still, today is the autumnal equinox, which does mean that winter is coming. And in what could be categorized as simply inevitable, Malware Hunter team researchers have found a strain of ransomware that demands nude pictures of the victim, not Bitcoin, as its ransom. The newly classified malware, called N-Ransomware, is actually a screen locker that doesn't encrypt files, which leads some to classify it as more prank than criminal enterprise. Still, it's deplorable. The extortion message reads in part, Your computer has been locked. It then tells the victim to email the hackers, and it goes on to explain, After we reply, you must send at least ten nude pictures of you. After that, we will have to verify that the nudes belong to you. The message is displayed over a picture of Thomas the Tank Engine, uttering a demotic oath in joining Parthenogenesis in the coarsest terms possible. And that seems just wrong, since no very useful engine would say any such thing. Sir Topham Hat, call your office and get your barristers working on a copyright injunction. By the way, we think the extortionists may be less than pleased should they get what they're asking for. I mean, suppose they hit up some lame security guy, the kind of Captain Obvious who tells people that password is a bad password? You're setting yourself up for maximal aesthetic insult skids. You may get more than you bargained for, but exactly what you deserve. A brief note about our sponsor, E8 Security. We've all heard a lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Hey, who of a certain age doesn't know that Skynet achieved self-awareness and sent the Terminator back to take care of business? But that's science fiction, and not even very plausible science fiction. But the artificial intelligence and machine learning E8 is talking about aren't science fiction at all, and they're here today. E8's white paper, available at e8security.com cyberwire, can guide you through the big picture of these still-emerging but already proven technologies. We all need to turn data into understanding and information into meaning. AI and machine learning can help you do that. See what they can do for you at e8security.com slash cyberwire. And we thank E8 for sponsoring our show. Joining me once again is Malek Ben Salem. She's the senior manager for security research and development at Accenture Labs. Malek, welcome back. Um, you have a new attack vector that you wanted to describe for us today. What do we need to know? Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, yes, this is a new attack vector that leverages the energy management module uh, that's running on any device to conduct a cyber attack. So we know that um, devices have a dynamic voltage and frequency scaling model that basically regulates the energy consumption on the device. 
Um, the operating frequency and the voltage can be configured via memory mapped registers from software, as well as uh, with some hardware. Uh, it turns out that these software registers can be leveraged to launch an attack against uh, the TPM or the trusted zone uh, on the device. An attacker can stretch the operational limits of the energy components, meaning changing the frequencies or the voltage of the device, and that can introduce or induce the system to fault. And those faults can be used to break the security properties of the system, uh, including confidentiality and uh, the integrity of the code running within the TPM environment. Now, what's unique about this attack is that unlike the traditional attacks, which uh, require an attacker to be in the physical proximity of the victim system, or they may need special equipment to conduct the attack, here um, the attacker does not need any of that. They don't need to be close to the device. They don't need to have special equipment. They can launch the attack just through software. And this attack uh, has been demonstrated on devices, on ARM devices, uh, so the attack can impact hundreds of millions of devices. So has this attack been seen in the wild, or is it merely in a stage of a proof of concept? No, this is uh, in the stage of a proof of concept. It has been demonstrated at the Usenix Security Conference uh, in August this year for the first time. So this is really a, a totally new, completely new attack uh, vector uh, that was demonstrated by researchers from Columbia University. Interesting stuff as always. Malek Ben Salem, thanks for joining us. Now I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Domain Tools. If you're a listener to this podcast, you already know that over the past year, ransomware has wreaked havoc on hospitals, transportation, nuclear plants, and more. This flavor of malware is particularly vicious and shows no signs of slowing. But on the positive side, much has been and can be learned from these attacks. And profiling ransomware actors is a smart way to create an informed cybersecurity strategy. Join Domain Tools for an insightful webinar with info security leader Kyle Wilhoit, who will help you understand ransomware trends, motivations, business workings, and of course how to combat ransomware attacks. Visit DomainTools.com slash Cyberwire to see the webinar today. That's DomainTools.com slash Cyberwire. And we thank Domain Tools for sponsoring our show. My guest today is Robert Sell. He's a senior IT manager for a major aerospace company, and this past year he competed in the social engineering competition at the DEF CON conference in Las Vegas, where he discovered it's remarkably easy to gather information on a targeted organization and to use it to get their employees to tell you even more. Every year, the social engineering village, um, what they will do is they will target a certain industry. And uh, this year, it was the gaming industry. And so what they will do is they will give all the candidates. Uh, this year, there was um, 16 competitors. And uh, we all got a company from a, that particular industry. And uh, sometimes they will warn each other and they'll say, hey, this is going on. Um, be careful when you answer the phone. And it's really interesting to see how it evolves over those couple days. Because a lot of the security people from those companies are actually uh, at DEF CON sometimes even in their room. And they react differently depending on um, how they view the whole exercise. There's two stages to the competition. The first stage is really the OSINT stage. That's uh, open source intelligence. And so what they want you to do, they give you certain flags. There's about 29 flags worth different amounts of points depending on the difficulty of the flag. They want you to then collect that information into a report. So for example, one of the flags would be, who does your garbage disposal? And uh, that would, would be worth so many points. Another one might be, what's your SSID for your Wi-Fi? And that would be a little more difficult to get, so that would be worth more points. And so just using open source intelligence, not engaging with the company at all, basically what you find on the Internet, you want to collect all those points and put it into the report. And so what was your strategy for gathering up that sort of information? 
Well, because it's a uh, corporate organization, one of the best sources I found was to start with anyway, was LinkedIn. It's amazing how much information you can pull off of that just to get started. And I started building an Excel spreadsheet based off of that. And very quickly, I had hundreds of data points, everything from executive personal cell phone numbers, home addresses, you name it, gym memberships, what they eat for lunch, uh, their pet names. And that really helps you to develop really solid pretexts. So yeah, there's a ton of information out there. And so you arrive at DEF CON and the the moment of truth is there. It's time for your 20 minutes in front of an audience. Take us through that. Yeah, when they called my name or, you know, ushered me into the booth, I was so excited because this is something I'd been thinking about for over a year. And I just remember trying to, I wasn't nervous at all. There's a few hundred people in the room and they're all watching you. So you'd expect some level of nervousness, but I was just so excited to go in there and and do my part and be part of this this whole village experience. And so it was just trying to calm down and get my heart rate to go down a little bit. This was the first probably 30 seconds. And then making those first few calls. And um, the first few calls I did, uh, I just got voicemail. And they start the clock, you've got 20 minutes, and that 20 minutes goes by incredibly fast, probably because it's, it's so fun. But the first 10 minutes, I had a real problem getting anybody. The phone would just ring. It would go to voicemail. I think most people perhaps were at lunch because I was calling around that time. So it was a bit disheartening at first. Uh, and then I had to fall back on, on my backup plan, and I started calling reception because they were always there. And that's when I finally got somebody and finally started scoring points. So the first 10 minutes was really uneventful, and everybody I could feel everybody's sympathy in the room. And um, the last 10 minutes is really where I really started to get points. And the last three minutes was where I really started to get points very quickly. Um, I had a very rapid fire pretext, uh, which was actually an engagement survey. And as soon as they agreed to do it, I just started firing off the questions. And they couldn't write down the points fast enough for those last two minutes, which was exciting. What was the information that you were assigned to collect? uh, And what was your successful strategy to do so? Yeah, so for the OSINT report, um, you basically collect all the flags that you can, um, just going through the list. For the uh, live vishing, your 20 minutes at, at DEF CON, for each person, you can um, get the same points. So, for example, if I get the SSID from person A, I can then go get it from person B as well. For me, basically what I wanted to do was run through as many flags as possible with anybody that I got. So one of my favorite pretexts is the engagement survey. So it would be, hello, I'm so-and-so calling from this company. I'm working with your VP of HR, who is this person. And she gave me your name as a person that could help me to really build this engagement survey. I just want to ask you a few questions really quickly to only take two minutes. And then boom, 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 boom. And um, that usually works very effectively. So what were some of the takeaways for you? What are some of the the lessons you took home uh, after experiencing this? It it was interesting to see how susceptible to attack this sort of attack companies are. And there is a ton of information out there. It's I don't think many people are, are looking at how protected their organizations are from this or how they're going to mitigate that risk. And so for me, coming back to the company where I work, it was I immediately wanted to look at how I could defend against that. So user awareness training, especially at the executive level, doing OSINT on yourself and your your company to see what's out there, I think is really important. And then looking at who is responsible should you get a breach of this kind. Um, If your executive comes to the IT security group and says, hey, I just gave all my information to so-and-so because I thought it was real. What does that mean to, to you, right? Odds are that we are responsible for that, but we often don't think about that very much. Our thanks to Robert Sell for joining us. We've got an extended version of this interview for our Patreon subscribers at patreon.com slash the cyberwire. There's lots more on that interview, including Robert's advice for first-timers at DEF CON. So check that out at patreon.com slash the cyberwire. 
And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors who make the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you through the use of artificial intelligence, check out Silence.com. The CyberWire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Social media editor is Jennifer Iben. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Have a great weekend. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.